FM Radio for the Agile Community. www.agile.fm. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Agile FM. And today I have a guest out of the UK, Caitlin Walker, uh, who wrote a book called From Contempt to Curiosity. Uh, she is a TEDx talker. She's delivering keynotes around the world. And uh, we uh, will actually see her in the United States a few times. For example, at the Agile 2018 in San Diego. And she's also going to come to New York, um, to my hometown in uh, September the 4th to deliver a workshop and uh, speak and deliver a keynote at the Agile Day 2018.org. But first, before we get started talking about your topic, Kathleen, Kathleen, welcome to the podcast. It's lovely to be here, all the way from Liverpool. Liverpool it is, right? So this is in, in the heart of everything uh, these days. We hear Liverpool everywhere, and uh, I'm excited to have you in here. Um, and uh, that is also explains your website, which is cleanlearning.co.uk, the Commonwealth the, of the United Kingdom, right? Uh, yes. Your Twitter is Caitlin Walker TA, and uh, just to make sure that people have the spelling right, because that is a little unusual spelling, Caitlin is with an I-N at the end. So, we want to talk about clean. We had a, a few episodes ago, we had um, Andrea uh, uh, Joe on the, uh, on, on the show, and she talked a little bit about uh, clean language. But you are actually, uh, you wrote a book, as I just said, the, From Contempt to Curiosity, and uh, you, you crossed paths in your career with clean language at some point, but your exposure to clean language came at a point where it's like you did other things. How did, how did this all start with you and how did you come to clean language and obviously had a huge impact on your career and your life afterwards? It did. I, was, I, was, I started life, you know, I was at university studying anthropology and linguistics and I was really interested in groups, how they form and how cultures form. And then I was also a youth worker in my, in my spare time. And then I was always thinking, there must be a way of getting groups to self-reflect, to self-organize without them all having to go and learn another process, you know, like they've all had to go on an NLP course or a counseling mm -hmm. course. Or, and when I saw this guy, David Grove, working with Clean, it was so simple. I watched it and I thought, you know what, I could teach that to my teenagers in minutes. Mm -hmm. So once I saw it, I, I first of all took it into the work I was using to uh, to fund my way through college. But then shortly after that, I was thinking, well, I could use it in college. I could use it with college lecturers. And then by chance, the first business that got in touch with me with it was an IT company, a knowledge management software development company. Mm -hmm. And they said, can, can you use it with programmers who won't speak to marketers and marketers who hate the programmers? I was like, oh, that's just gangs. Mm -hmm. My youth work has prepared me for this. And mm -hmm. so, yes, it's a, it was a process that I completely fell in love with. Mm -hmm. you, you, it's potential everywhere. Right, and you, you did mention, uh, even in your TEDx talk and now on this, this podcast, you, you mentioned David, right, who had obviously given this tool away of clean language or the questions itself. And uh, you mentioned uh, in, in your talk that it's there for the people to use it and make something out of it. Absolutely. it's not. Today. David Grove did not take this this amazing tool that he, he co-created, he created it, uh, he's, he's the main creator, but he was also working with his, his wife, Kai Davies. Um, Kai Davies Lynn is still doing the therapeutic use of clean language. Mm -hmm. But what David said was, it's, a, it's an amazing tool he's created, but it was fine for him if I wanted to take it off into groups and into organizational development or somebody else wanted to take it into music mm -hmm. or somebody else wanted to take it into osteopathy and how to work with somatic memories. So, mm -hmm. We we always say, please remember David. He's not around anymore. He's he he died unfortunately, but he really said, take it, apply it, find out how it works, come back and tell other people. Yes, and you did a lot of that. You actually <laughs> did a lot of work on this, right? So there's an entire book uh, around it, and you you just mentioned something. Uh, I want to clarify. There's also a topic you. Uh, um, you highlighted is the systematic modeling, the embodied metaphors. Uh, do you mind like just 
like you know in a very short like how, for listeners who might not be familiar with all these kind of things what they are yeah. and how so, they how they connect with clean so a, to be clean is is a very simple concept it means that when somebody says something they have their attention on what they're saying and instead of bringing their attention to you with your questions you want to keep their attention on themselves and ask them a question which accepts and extends what they've just said so for example if like an interview I've had today, somebody says, I'm stuck with my journey. Mm -hmm. Then I can say to them, and when you're stuck, what kind of stuck? When you're stuck with your journey, what kind of journey is that journey? Or and when you're stuck, what would you like to have happen? So there are lots of questions that I can place close to their sentence that then allow them to expand their thinking without them having to also process my ideas or my metaphors or my agenda. And that's just between one person and another. When I came across David's work, I could easily see how if you just drop in a few of these tools into a meeting, mm -hmm. then very, very quickly, rather than what usually happens in meetings, which is where somebody speaks and somebody else bides their time until they can say what they're thinking, instead of that behavior or jostling for attention in a meeting, instead, when somebody says something like, I'm stuck with my journey, one other person can say, all right, what's, what kind of stuck? I say, oh, well, I keep getting distracted. And somebody else can say, so when you're getting distracted, where's the distracted coming from? And two or three questions from your team expands your thinking. And then you can move from modeling the individual to, okay, well, who's, when he's stuck with his journey, who's got any other ideas? So you can move from individual and out to group and create a networked response to a problem rather than mm -hmm. either a wrangling between people or one person just talking. So it's mm -hmm. all creating network responses. Well, so this is really, as a, this was like one application, like a typical standard meeting where these clean languages could be applied to start a more engaged experience. Yeah. Um, your book was released in 2014. And since then, a, a lot of clean kind of things have happened for you and as an industry as a whole. If you had to assess like the last four years, it's 2018 right now at the time of recording, um, what do you think has changed in the world of clean? Where do you see uh, changes being made or applications and so forth? Um, where you see like there was a definitely like a, a breakthrough moment or some sort in the yeah. industry. Well, if I take 1999 to 2014, if I take those 15 years, Oh, yeah. Those 15 years were all, what is this stuff and what can it do? And so a lot of that time was, A, saying yes to things. People would say, oh, you know, can you use this in diversity training for unconscious bias? Yep, it turns out we can. Can you use it in um, higher education? Yep, we can use it in Oxford Side Business School for business development. Yep. So a lot, that was what those 15 years were. Between 2014, since I wrote the book, which consolidated a lot of that thinking, and up to 2018, it's been, can somebody else learn this and have similar results to me without all of my experience? So I've spent the last four years developing, a, there's a whole school in Moscow, and Cora Imparo in Moscow have taken this work, they've trained 900 people over the last three years in clean language so that they have a thriving um, clean community in education, in business. Um, we've gone and done presentations at Google Moscow. At, mm -hmm. um, so there's that little crowd. We've got a, a little crowd in in um, in Europe. So there's lots of, not all started by me, obviously, mm -hmm. but there's clean in France. We've got um, Andrea Chu, who you mentioned earlier, is really working hard to develop systemic modeling and clean language applications in the U.S., Mm. And so it's in Japan. We've got a whole there's a whole school in Japan. So it's a lot of the last four years has been going. Let's look at how it has to be altered or updated when it goes into a completely different culture. What's the feedback we get? And also, is it is it scalable? Is it transferable? Can can somebody without my background and my experience get those those results? And it turns out we can. But that's really been the focus of the last four years. Mm -hmm. Wow, that seems quite a ride. Um, if if you're just outlining like that, and I was also surprised that it was from 1999. Uh, now you just spelled it out. It, that's an uh, it's an impressive impressive time frame since these concepts have been around. 
Now I'm here with uh, Caitlin Walker, who uh, wrote the book uh, From Contempt to Curiosity. We we'll just touched on the topic of clean. Uh, we got some examples around it. We'll talk a little bit about the systematic modeling, and we're going to return to this podcast in just one moment. Do you enjoy Agile FM and listen to the episodes on a regular basis? Especially since this podcast is dedicated to Agile, feedback is important. Give us a quick rating or leave a brief review on iTunes. If you'd like to comment on a specific episode, visit the show page on agile.fm. Thank you. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm here with uh, Caitlin Walker. We talk about uh, items from her book, from her TEDx talk. And one thing, um, Caitlin, I, I do want to touch, you just gave a bunch of uh, examples of application, mostly of them in, in Russia uh, and some, some companies uh, there. Now, when we talked about your uh, keynotes and where your speaking engagements are right now, one thing that comes uh, pops up quite a bit is Agile. We're here on Agile FM, right? So that topic intrigues me. <laughs> and um, so I do want to talk a little bit about the connect between clean and Agile as a whole. I mean, you, you do speak at the Agile 2018 in San Diego, um, and you do speak at the Agile Day in uh, New York in September. Yep, I'm going to be Agile, Lean and Agile in Brighton in, in October mm -hmm. uh, 2018. So there's a lot of Lean and Agile there. What there's a lot of Lean and Agile. Right. So your background is, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is not based on, on Agile development practices. So, right. mm -hmm. so you're crossing paths now. And what is it you see for the Agile community like us, uh, why this could be so beneficial? Where does that fit in based on your expertise? Okay, so one of the things about clean is that it's about the quality of attention that you pay to somebody. So if I'm listening to you with clean attention, I'm listening for just what's pertinent to whatever topic we're involved in and also really able to, set, to, to separate what's going on for you and what's going on for me. And it's that kind of thinking requires you to be nimble. It requires you to be high quality attention to know what it is you're here for. And it's also... It, forces you to be up for iterations and emergence. So if I ask you a clean question, I can't control the answer that you give me. You will give me what I get, and then I have to build on what I've got in order to expand and improve it. And I think that the skills required in clean absolutely fundamentally lend themselves to the skills required to be agile. Mm. Now, I don't, I don't profess at all to be an expert in agile, I think I was very lucky that the first big piece of business I got involved in, um, it was a company that were naturally very agile before agile was a thing. Mm. But systemic modeling, it seems to me, um, in the same way that it, it suits all sorts of collaborative learning, it's, it really lends itself to the basic skills an organization needs before they can become lean and agile. Mm -hmm. So there's a, there's a clear... Um your advice would be clean would be a technique that would enable agility. Yes. Not the other way it's, around. And it's especially when you are, when you have organizations that are resistant. Mm -hmm. um, so I was often brought in to be quite disruptive to, to help an organization move from, from one way of thinking. For example, the, um, the police national search center, center, our anti-terrorism organization, they, they brought me in, in order to move from, um, one kind of thinking into being aware of their unconscious bias and very nimble and lean and able to respond at source when there were conflicts rather than things escalating. Mm -hmm. So that kind of disruption from an old style um, top down, here's what we're going to do and knowing what we're going to deliver months, years in advance to actually what's, let's be more responsive, let's be more responsive to the current culture and to what's happening in the moment. Mm -hmm. that's, that's how I developed clean it was to do that kind of work and that seems to be when I talk to the agile people who come on my trainings or who ask me to come and speak or to, de to design interventions in their organizations it is that movement from the sh attention to outcome that they might have used to have had and then forcing things through now to being more attentive to what's happening in this moment mm -hmm. keeping it in mind but mm -hmm. moving lightly and leanly in order to achieve it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so what's, what's interesting is um, in the world of Agile in 2018, there's a lot of tools are being used, electronic tools, 
uh, there's a lot of communication going on, uh, you know, in quotes, communication going on within these tools. So there's a lot of back and forth. There's, you know, some form of texting going on and all these things. Um, so we have stepped aside from the original face-to-face, -face, uh, in interpersonal kind of communication uh, to electronic communication. How do you, um, how do you, I, 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 I totally see here the application of this tool, uh, but there are some obstacles. Some teams that work distributed and might not actually communicate well enough, and maybe these other things. How can how can a team use like clean techniques to improve an environment like this, where they rely so heavily on technical uh, kind of communication, where um, where the follow up question couldn't be really clean, right? In an electronic conversation, we wouldn't really say things, and then we would follow up with a clean language. What is your advice? Bringing people together again? Question mark. It's, mm Okay, so I do think that there are some great benefits if you're going to to learn to, to alter your attention, to be less sure of your assumptions and more open to being interested in the person in front of you or the people, even if they're not in front of you, but virtually in front of you. Mm -hmm. I do think that it's, it is easier to do that in a small group face-to-face. -face. However, mm -hmm. we've never had that um, in, in the... 18 years that I've been doing this, we haven't had that uh, luxury all the time. We've always needed to work remotely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The important thing, for, to my mind, is that you don't just use the tools, as in you don't just use your electronic tools, that you spend some time with a team, a, a particularly a remote or a virtual team, you spend some time just paying attention to who's here, how they think about things, what mm -hmm. they're... Um, so you have a little bit of getting to know the team a sort of what I think of as a rough guide to, mm -hmm. because I think that that time spent in clean, getting to know one another before you then go into a project or before you then come into potential conflict, mm -hmm. that that time at the beginning will save you so much time and goodwill later on. Yeah. Do you think if you're going to do going to use the virtual um, resources and the apps and the and the texting? First of all, make sure that that team spends some time, some due diligence, getting to know who's here, how they like communicating. They're a little bit like what? Find some metaphors for what they're like when they're working at their best, because these things are sticky, and they they make that virtual person or those or those words in a page. They hang them together in something meaningful, mm -hmm. and we all like to communicate better when when people mean something to us. Oh, I I had a, like I would have an abundance of examples out of my own work where I could absolutely sign this what you just said right how important this is. We had people um, that flew in um, from from other parts of the world and and they met the team the very first time and I, I couldn't tell you how much it changed um, the minute uh, when these team members actually met in person. Uh, what then happened weeks after when they were back in a remote conversation, how yeah. more personal it was, right? How people treated each other with much more respect. Um, they inquired about family even because a kid was sick at the time of the visit and uh, and then they actually followed up, how's your kid doing and stuff. Like things like that would never have happened before. Um, they had face, been, face, face, face to face, exactly. And just also spending some time and body language and everything comes into the mix, right? Yes. Now, I understand we don't all have that privilege, but let's say there's 18 of us in a team. It's absolutely worth us breaking away into little groups of six and spending just – it doesn't have to be touchy-feely. And I'm, I'm used to working where people don't necessarily want to have a therapy session, but just to get to know a little bit about what's on top, where people's attention are, if this meeting were to go or this project were to go just the way they'd like it to, it will be like what? Mm -hmm. They would like to be like what? Those kind of questions help people to get, as I said, sticky. And that, that's the same as you're talking about knowing about their child or being able to have those more intimate um, mm -hmm. hooks that then uh, allow us to want to go that extra mile for somebody because we feel attached to them in some way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in your in your TEDx talk, you actually mentioned that you played way way back before the whole clean played a very very different role, right? You, um, if I recollect right, the right definition was like you worked as a in a in a street worker program or something like that, right? Uh, yes, I was. Well, I was a I was a youth worker, but I was a it was called a street youth worker. So I was mm -hmm. um, out running around. I, I, we, actually, my company still does that role. So mm -hmm. as I, as we grew into business we decided that we didn't want to be, that we still had a mission, that we didn't want to just 
create tools for rich people to get richer, that what we wanted to do is that we spend 50% of our time still on the on the streets mm -hmm. working with disaffected teenagers and uh, and then the other time in corporate. Mm -hmm. You still have that connect or did you, at, at this point, you're too busy and you do notes, keynotes no, I, and so I, forth? That's what I was doing. So yesterday I was in the streets of Liverpool picking up teenagers and yeah, and, and help su supporting them, especially teenagers who are outside of the school system, and supporting them to develop exact, it's, it's exactly the same skills. Mm -hmm. We get them to develop in small groups to, to become peer coaching, to help each other find work or college that they like. And they are exactly the same skills as I would be teaching when I'm in Moscow with Google. Mm -hmm. There's no, no difference to the fundamental human ability to pay attention to one another and consider what would we like to have happen, to move from problem to outcome to action. Mm -hmm. The same skills everywhere. Same skills everywhere. And you're basically very well connected to where you started and where you see um, the, the, the impact you did, uh, not only on the corporate level, I appreciate that, right? And uh, also on, on the area where you uh, yeah, grew up and the first things you did in your, in your career. But obviously, you got an abundance of uh, new challenges here. Um, you mentioned a little bit some 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 Google in in uh, in, in Russia and uh, some other things in, in in Russia. You mentioned the the, the, the youth program we just talked about. Um, you are affiliated with a university, which we're going to come to. You you are connected with the university, right? If I remember correctly. Yes, I'm still with Liverpool John Moore's University. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's just say, if somebody who's listening to this right now might say, "Well, that sounds uh, I don't know how that relates to." Uh, agile companies, where right? we, we did hear Google in, in Russia, but are there any kind of uh, other examples you might have what companies are doing with clean outside of maybe that one company or the youth program? Just to um, just elaborate a little bit more on, on things like where where else do you see the application and what do maybe some experiments out there? It's companies that are experimenting yeah. maybe with this. I mean, the, the big thing, Joe, it's it's I guess for me, they all. I don't distinguish the sectors um, mm -hmm. the way some people do. And it's true. I go into fast-moving um, uh, fast moving consumer goods company, Jay's Group. And so there, they were in silos and they wanted to work. Um, they, they wanted to reduce the amount of waste and, re and reduce the cost of their procurement. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to shift from a, a silo in a very traditional model. And one of the questions they kept saying was, well, what experience do you have in our, in our business? And I said, you know, I don't. I have no, at, at that stage, this was um, 10 years ago, I've got no experience in your business. However, because we have experience across so many businesses, I know how to get people to behave more leanly and more agilely. Mm -hmm. And so it's not just in an IT arena. There are lots and lots of companies that are trying to make the same shifts. So there, what we got together, we got together with the, um, all the heads of department. And it's very similar. We get them to consider when somebody speaks, how fast do they make assumptions? We, we play, play around with this until they're absolutely clear how much of their time they waste being sure of the point that they wanted to make somewhere right. rather than attending to the people who are around them and using the intelligence of the group in order to co-create solutions to, to problems live in the moment. Mm -hmm. So with Jay's group, what they said was that it, it broke down all of their, the silo thinking, but it allowed their meetings to become shorter, they were able to give better quality feedback, and the most important thing is that they were able to challenge one another at source when things, when things weren't right. So what they didn't do was to create big problems that then escalated. They yeah. were able to, to challenge each other without it going into conflict. Mm -hmm. So you've got things like, like Jay's group, you've got um, and Clarify is another organization where we worked with the whole organization, they're uh, business development people. Um, but es essentially, the core of clean, of core of systemic modeling, which is my, my development of clean, yeah. is to keep a group out of contempt, because contempt, drama, blame, um, deciding what somebody should do and then, and then thinking that they're not good enough because they didn't do it. All of those things waste time and slow up learning. That's so right. That, it's the enemy of any lean and agile thinking. Oh, yeah. I, uh, just based on what you were just saying, I'm, I know you're going to have a full crowd in your um, agile talks uh, around the world because that resonates very well um, with the work we do as well. You 
You said you are open to uh, inquiries for universities for um, applying clean language and for the curriculum design. Is that still mm -hmm. something? Uh, yes. You yes. you. So how does how does that all apply to that piece of the world um, of curriculum design? Oh, I mean that's that's just a piece of work I've been asked to come and fulfil. So I've been asked to go out and find a bunch of different universities and program design teams within them, and we're using because you can use clean language questions as a modeling format so you can find anybody who's good at something within an organization model it quite cleanly lightly and then take that model and apply it into other other areas so at the moment i'm involved in with five different universities finding mm -hmm. uh, great great examples of curriculum design that's actually happening it's not not what's theoretical not what people say you should be doing but what what actually happens in the teams asking them these questions and then creating metaphor models, mm -hmm. sticky metaphor models to then illustrate other people how they could design their own curricula better in mm -hmm. order to keep their students engaged. Would this be also something of uh, like taking it to the next step, making clean part of uh, some of the degree programs itself? We've got um, at Liverpool John Moore's again about 10 years ago mm -hmm. eight years ago they're still using it now but about about eight years ago they commissioned us to come and help them create a learning to learn environment with their students and their staff mm -hmm. and so they then taught all the students clean language from the first so they did maybe an hour every fortnight um, mm -hmm. and they made it they made it so that it was marked so the students had to do it and, and as part of their degree And lots of the students could not see the value in it in the first year. I need to be really clear with you. Mm -hmm. But by the third year, they, many of them would look back and say that was the most important part of their learning, the, the learning how to learn. Wow. The university, you can't make a X caused Y, but the results went, it used to be 49% got two, one and above. Then it was, it was 56% on the first year. Then it was 63 and then it was 75. So across those three years... It went from 49% to 75% of the students got the top two grades in that department. Mm. That was a huge shift. Oh, yeah. And, and the, the only trouble was, I want to, again, mm. put a little, a little caution here. It only works if the staff and the people in charge buy into the idea that they have to stop thinking in the old way and they have to shift their thinking to this lighter, leaner way of paying attention to each other. Because you try and get that same result at a department where people haven't bought in, and it's just it's just a waste of time. Right. It's a real principle of systemic modeling is that the leadership need to be using it and demonstrating its tangible value before I would go in and run a larger intervention. Wow. Yeah. Right. This is a, definitely a pattern we, we have seen here now through through this podcast here with you about this commitment to this uh, technique, and maybe the last segment you just had is also being patient. Uh, with it, right? It doesn't come overnight necessarily um, when you see like the success, but it's also, isn't it wonderful to have like a reward like this a year after when people really turn around and say like, this was amazing. Uh, yes. That is a good feeling, isn't it? Oh, it's fantastic. Yeah, and there's nothing, there's nothing like it. Yeah. It's nothing like, the best thing, Joe, it's, it's when you go back in, not straight after you finish, but we try to do our evaluation nine months, at least nine months after we've left. Because I'm not looking for a tick of a happy sheet. I'm looking for, could the organization take the methodology and then transform it into something new that suits their organization so that when I go back, they're doing something that I could never have thought of. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'm always looking for is, is it sustainable? And then does it, does it iterate and transform into something new outside of what I imagined? Mm -hmm. so always looking for nine months afterwards. Wow. Well, I think this is really a good um, ending to this to this podcast. It's just to reflect on this uh, a little bit retrospectively. Um, I do want to thank you, Caitlin, for sharing some of your uh, thoughts here around uh, clean clean language. Um, for everybody interested in more, uh, Caitlin, uh, there is a book from Contempt to Curiosity, and uh, there's also a TED Talk out there. People can watch on on YouTube, uh, and they can get in touch with you at Caitlin Walker TA. Um, or visit your website at cleanlearning.co.uk and um, there's a lot of ways of getting in touch with you and uh, starting the dialogue around this. I want to thank you and I'm looking really forward to that workshop on the 4th of September uh, 2018. So, you know, I've never been to New York City, Joe. It's, I know it's your hometown, but I've never been there and I'm so excited to come to New York. Right, spend, yeah, come, in, come in early, spend an extra day. It's uh, 
you know, <laughs> city never sleeps. <laughs> um, yeah, so I want to thank you. You're also going to speak at the San Diego conference. It's also a good uh, a way for getting in touch with you. And uh, until then. That's lovely. Looking forward to hearing all about and, all, and also building these bridges with the Agile community. It's really, really interesting to find out what we, we as the clean community will learn from you as well as what we can teach. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to Agile FM, the radio for the Agile community. I'm your host, Show Krebs. If you're interested in more programming and additional podcasts, please go to www.agile.fm. Talk to you soon. Thank you.